I just want to jump right in today, and I'm going to tell you that the, the message that I'm going to offer today is a pretty straightforward one, um, and uh, I, I hope that it will be impactful. I want to talk to you about holiness, and some of you just had the same sensation you have when someone says, uh, it's time to go to the dentist. Um, but I, I hope that uh, as you uh, learn with me a little bit today about holiness and what it means for us, that you will actually find this to be uh, a topic that's both challenging yet at the same time refreshing. And let's begin by stating the obvious, which is that God is a holy God. This is one of the most important things that we learn about God in Scripture, that He is holy. It's difficult to describe exactly what it means that God is holy, but, but I'll give it a try. Um, when we say that God is holy, we're saying that His character is impeccable that he is morally pure, that he is only good and only does good, only capable of doing good, and that he is fully devoted to his own good purposes. As we'll learn a little later, holiness at its essence is being fully devoted to God and his purposes. Holy is not just an attribute of God, Holy is who God is through and through. To say that God is holy is to say that God is God. God is holy. Last week, uh, for those of you who were here, uh, I referenced a couple of visions where both Isaiah and John were caught up into the throne room of God, and there were these living creatures flying around in front of the throne room who were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Um, to uh, use uh, uh, a, a word to capture someone's attention multiple times isn't unusual in Scripture. Jesus would say, for instance, truly, truly. It meant pay attention to what I'm about to say, or, or, or other translations would say, verily, verily, pay attention. But when these creatures in these two scenes in heaven are praising God, thrice they say, holy, 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 holy. It's the only time in all of Scripture that an attribute of God is mentioned in that literary uh, repetitive uh, way, holy, holy, holy. It's like, pay attention, pay special attention to this understanding of God. God is holy. Now, I don't think that it's difficult for uh, those of us who believe to acknowledge the holiness of God. We, 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 we know that that's something that's true about God. I think, though, what's perhaps difficult for many of us is to understand how holiness is relevant to our day-to-day -day lives. How is holiness relevant to us? And uh, I'll begin that discussion by offering a really big idea, which is to say that because we are his people, we are holy. When he put his name on you, when he made you his, you became holy. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Because we are in union with him, we are counted as holy. Now the difference between us and him, well, there's a whole lot that could be said about that is holiness isn't all that we are, but we are counted holy. Uh, Baker's topical uh, expository dictionary of biblical words, which is a wonderful resource, uh, in its article on holiness says that because God is holy, his places 
and people are holy as well. In other words, whatever is his, by definition, is holy. And it's because we are holy that we are called then to conduct ourselves by holy people. See, a whole lot of understanding spiritual growth is this simple. It's actually becoming who God says we are in the realities of our everyday lives. And so we are called holy, and then we are called to actually live like holy people. We see, therefore, holiness is both a condition and it is an imperative. In other words, we can say that it's true about ourselves to the limited degree in which people can be described as holy, but we can say it's true of ourselves that we are holy, and at the same time, it is holiness is, is also an imperative, meaning something that we must do. So we must now, as holy people, actually pursue holiness. We are to strive to live as holy people. Peter wrote that just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written... And then he quotes from God's words in the Pentateuch, be holy because I am holy. Now, friends, this is not a suggestion. This is part of what it means to be his. To be his is to be holy and to live a holy life. And you may say, you know, I never think of myself as a holy person, which on one hand is probably a good thing. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to think about it in the way that I'm describing it today. Now, I'm encouraging you to not walk around introducing yourself as a holy person. But, but in, in, in the context of today, you may say, I, I don't think of myself as a holy person. You know, I'm not, you know, a, a saint. I'm not Saint Paul or Saint John or, 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 or Saint Mother Teresa, or Saint John Paul, you know, no one who knows me is ever going to call me your holiness. But I want to remind you, and I want to stress this point, that in the New Testament, all of us who are his are called saints or holy people. In fact, Paul would often open his letters to those Christians who were people just like us, dealing with the same kind of stuff we deal with, and wondering about themselves, I'm sure, in relationship to God, like many of us do. And Paul would write, and he would open his letter by referring to the people he was writing to as saints. Uh, For instance, to the Romans, in Romans chapter 1, he writes to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Uh, Another translation, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. Saints are holy people. So perhaps you should, in fact, turn to the person next to you and say, hello, your holiness. Uh, Or uh, or some of you are feeling very awkward now. I didn't really ask you to do that. I offered it as a suggestion of something perhaps could do. Or you could look at someone and say, hello, Saint. Hello, Saint Julian. Hello, Saint Lauren, the fact is you are called saints. The fact is you are called holy people. So you may be a contractor, but you are, according to God's word, a holy contractor. You may be a homemaker, but you are a holy homemaker. You may be a medical doctor, but you are a holy medical doctor. You may be a banker, but you are a holy banker. You may be a lawyer. Wait a second. But according to God's word, you are a holy lawyer. Please don't sue me for teasing a little bit about. The reason that you are a holy person is because you are his. He put his name on you. He said, you are mine. And I am holy, and therefore the things that are mine are holy. So again, holy is something we are, and it's also something that we're becoming and commanded to become. This means that we are becoming more like God in our character. This means that we are becoming more morally pure. This means that we are becoming more good. 
This means that we are doing more good. It means that we are more and more fully devoted to God and his good purposes. We are becoming more like him. Another term we would use is godly. We are called to become godly, to be more godlike. And one of the ways that we're supposed to manifest this is through holiness. And by the way, the process of becoming more holy in our lives is called sanctification. It's a good word for the day. Sanctification. It's the process of becoming more holy in our lives. Now, before I go further, let me pause and tell you a, a, a little story to make a, a, a story that's too long to make the simple point I want to make, but I, I want to tell it anyway. So, uh, so uh, uh, many of you know that Sharon and I celebrated our 40th anniversary last spring, and we decided leading up to it that we were going to save some money and make an investment in an epic experience for our 40th anniversary. And so we did that. We went on a 15-day cruise in Europe. And um, one day while on this cruise, we um, docked in Valencia, Spain, and we uh, went on a walking tour of that ancient city. And we were standing in a famous plaza there around a plaque etched in the paving stones there uh, in the middle of that plaza. And um, the, um, the plaque is a plaque that's written to the Roman soldiers that uh, Valencia was founded for. If I remember right, 136 BC, the Roman emperor founded Valencia as a place where Roman soldiers could retire. And uh, so we're standing there, and our guide, uh, a Spanish woman, is in halting English explaining to us what's going on. And we're, again, we're all st just standing around this thing, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, an elderly gentleman walks across this plaque right in front of all of us, oblivious to the fact that any of the rest of us were there, and he walks up urgently to the guide, and he interrupts her mid-explanatory sentence, and uh, I was standing close enough to hear him say that he had, uh, as an American tourist who was with another tour group, become separated from his group and his wife. Now, it was apparent to me that he didn't really care that much about the fact he'd been separated from his group, but the fact that he'd been separated from his wife was a matter of tremendous urgency to him. I'm going to guess that this gentleman was 80 years old, and one would imagine that they had been married for a long, long time, and it just wasn't a good thing for this gentleman to be lost in a foreign city and separated from his wife. Well, our guide was not very helpful. She was just trying to do her job, and she kind of uh, was patronizing, actually, and, and, and as quickly as possible got back into explaining whatever it was she was explaining. Well, over the next half hour or so, this elderly gentleman with a look of forlorn desperation on his face kept passing us by, obviously looking for his wife. And uh, finally, as some of us on the group started encouraging our guide, uh, you know, many of us on the group, Sharon and I were actually a, a younger couple on the group, which is going to stun some of you, but uh, there clearly were a number of people on the group, married couples who've been married for many, many years. And, and, and when you've been with someone for a long time, you understand what this guy's feeling, and it's not pleasant at all. And he's, again, he's a, probably an 80-year-old guy. So Finally, our guide gets another guide, his tour group guide, on the phone, and I'm standing close by, and uh, uh, it becomes obvious that they've agreed that they're going to they're going to meet in a certain plaza. The, our guide tries to explain to this elderly gentleman who's very rattled and doesn't understand what she's saying. And finally, I stepped in and I said, sir, if you'll just stay with us, we're going to take you to your wife. And the look of relief that passed over his face was a thing to behold. He squared his shoulder, looked like a different person, started marching with us. And sure enough, we go to a plaza where, where you know, it's, it's, I, I wish I had a picture of it. It's this idyllic, romantic, Manic, uh, 
plaza in Valencia, Spain with these beautiful old buildings and balconies and flowers and a fountain. And, and it, but the important thing is on one side of this plaza, this group is standing there with this guy's wife and it's that group and it's us, probably more than a hundred people all together. And the guy runs from our group across the plaza to his wife who separates herself from that group. And then typical of a wife in a situation like that, she's mad at him. <laughs> and the, the, the moment, you know, is, 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 is halted in time while he stands there. I've been in this situation so many times in my life <laughs> trying to explain how he screwed this situation up. <laughs> He's standing there trying to explain and she's looking at him and then all of a sudden she just gives up her anger, throws her arms around him and they kiss each other and a hundred people in this plaza burst into applause that goes on and a number of us, maybe even yours truly, wiped a tear or two from our eyes watching this scene. This couple, they were just meant to be together and things weren't right when they weren't. Well, I was thinking about that in relationship to one of my favorite psalms. And it's the psalm that tells us that uh, there are, it, it intimates to us that there are some things in God's economy that are just meant to go together. And if they're not together, things are not right. It's that psalm that says that Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Or another translation, righteousness and peace will embrace. There are inseparable couples in Scripture. And one of those inseparable couples, along with righteousness and peace, is holiness and grace. Or as John said it in the first chapter of his gospel, truth and grace. One without the other simply doesn't work. They have to be together. They have to kiss each other. They have to embrace. They have to, as they move forward, they have to walk hand in hand. And if they don't, nothing works the way it's supposed to work. Now, having said that, let me then organize the rest of today's talk around three holy understandings. And the first one then is holiness and grace must embrace. Holiness and grace must embrace. We can only successfully pursue holiness if we do it by God's grace. Here's the letter to the Hebrews in the first century. Pursue holiness Without it, no one will see the Lord. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God. Pursue holiness, don't fall short of grace. See, some people would think that holiness and grace are opposites. Uh, if they are, well, then opposites attract because holiness and grace go together. Pursue holiness, don't miss grace. Another translation, work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. So, first of all, there's the imperative. We are called, we are commanded to pursue holiness. We are commanded to work to live a holy life. As the great John Stott said, holiness is not a condition into which we drift. We don't accidentally become holy in our conduct. Now you understand I'm saying there's a positional part of this that's because we are his, we are holy. But there's a conditional part of it that says that in the realities of everyday life, we actually have to live this thing out in a way where we see holiness evidenced in the way that we think and conduct ourselves and, and so on. So, so in, in, in order for us to grow in our condition to be more holy people, we must pursue it. We must go after it. We must work at it. It doesn't just accidentally happen. But we, we also, we can't do it ourselves. 
We're not capable. We, we aren't meant to do it ourselves. Thankfully, holiness and grace are, 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 are embracing in this quest. As Jerry Bridges wrote in his beautiful book, The Discipline of Grace, the pursuit of holiness requires sustained and vigorous effort. It allows for no indolence, no lethargy, no half-hearted commitment, and no laissez-faire attitude toward even the smallest sins. In short, it demands the highest priority in the life of a Christian because to be holy is to be like Christ, God's goal for every Christian. And then, on the very same page, he says, at the same time, however, the pursuit of holiness must be anchored in the grace of God. Otherwise, it is doomed to failure. So we're going to pursue holiness, but we're going to do it understanding grace. And we think about grace today, let's think about it in three ways. First of all, let's think about grace as we probably typically think about it at, at when we're in, in, a, in, a, in a church or scripture setting. We, we think about God's unmerited favor. We think about the fact that we've been saved by grace through faith, meaning that there's nothing that we did to earn what God did through Jesus to save us. All we could do is believe that what he did was enough. So we are saved by grace. Secondly, when we think about grace, we should think about the ongoing work of God in our lives to help bring us sanctification, to help make us more holy, to help make us more godly, more godlike. The only way that that can happen is by the ongoing work of grace. We're never good enough to deserve God's active involvement in our life. Nonetheless, he is involved in our life through his spirit, helping us become more like himself. That's grace. It's grace. And then uh, when we think about grace, we can also think about the charisms of the Holy Spirit, but that the, the gifts that come by the Holy Spirit that help us be able to do more than we could do in our own strength and capacity. But the bottom line is, the only way in, in today's uh, 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 theme that we can pursue holiness is that grace is always active. God is doing for us what we don't deserve. It's not that we earn it. It's not that we become good enough. It's not that we perfect the spiritual disciplines. In our humanity, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to need forgiveness. We're going to need help. Help. The bottom line is we're going to need grace. We're going to need God to be helping us become what he's commanding us to become. Note the language in Romans chapter 12. I'm thinking about this verse kind of as the theme verse for this trimester here at TLCC. This is where Paul said, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. What we're really going to talk about during the first three series of this trimester is offering the entirety of who we are to God through lordship, through stewardship, through worship. So, so th th this is what we're called to do, but we're called to do it in view of God's mercy. Or if you look at it in the message, uh, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. The part I want to emphasize is God helping you. How am I going to give myself to God in the, in, in the entirety of who I am? Everything I am submitted to his lordship. God helping you. Pursue holiness with grace. So, by his grace, then, God is at work. And so we are working, we're going to work on this. We're saying, I, I want to become more holy. God is working. God is working, we are working. There's this partnership going on. And, uh, and, 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 and so, so you say, who, who, who's doing this? Well, he's doing it. Who's doing it? We're doing it. The fact is, as we're going to work on our lives, God is at work by his grace in our lives, making us who he calls us to be. Uh, here are two passages of scripture I've mentioned many, many, many times over the years, but I find them to be extremely helpful talking about these kind of subjects. The first is Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, by the way, I'll get into this a little bit more here in a few moments. You know in scripture the word obey is a good word. I know it's not a popular word today. 
I know some parents, they don't even want to use the word obey with their children which I don't know how to help you if you're not willing to, to, to teach your kids how to obey. That's one of your jobs, by the way, is to teach your kids, here's what you're supposed to do, now obey, all right? That's the subject for another day. I just lost a bunch of you there. It's like, wait a minute. <clears throat> the next thing you know is going to be preaching against participation trophies. Yeah, maybe, maybe next week. But... Uh, <laughs> Okay, I just had several of you get mad at me. I'm just playing around. It doesn't mean I'm not being honest, but I'm just playing around. So, so Paul says, you've, you've been obeying, and this is a good thing. Not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, when I was a kid growing up in a very legalistic church, that's the only part of the scripture I ever heard. I heard it thousands of times. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It was a marvelous message for a seven-year-old to constantly hear. Uh, I'm still in therapy. No, I'm not. I'm the, my therapy is trying to, to understand what scripture really says. I'm going to quit these stupid little foolish asides. I'm sorry. The nine o'clock service. I I was so disciplined, and uh, nonetheless, I'm not blaming you. I'm just saying. So, 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 all I ever heard is work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You know this image of an angry God who's, you know, you're supposed to be afraid of. And 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 the fact is, we are supposed to work out our salvation. In other words, we're saved by grace through faith. Now we work that out in the daily realities of our life. But and we do it with with honor and reverence and respect and understanding the seriousness of what it is to be serving a holy God. But that's not the end of the passage. It goes on to say for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So on one hand, work out your salvation. Be serious about it. Understand that this God's not playing around. We're supposed to be holy as he is holy. And if you give God any opportunity at all, God is going to work in you, helping you to want to do those things he's calling you to do and helping you actually be able to do it. See, God works in us even at the level of motivation. And there are folks in this room, I have no doubt, who you're surprised that you're even finding yourself somewhat interested in the subject of holiness. And, and perhaps it's occurred to you in the last few minutes that you actually would like like to be more holy. You'd like to live in a way that really pleases a holy God. And I'm telling you, the fact that you have that desire is God working in you. God is at work in you, helping you want to do the things that he's calling you to do and giving you the power to do them. Here's another great passage. It's Paul writing to the Thessalonians. You're probably familiar with this, many of you. It's gorgeous, beautiful, Beautiful. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is faithful, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. So we're not on our own here, guys, in our pursuit of holiness. The God who calls us is sanctifying us through and through. And you say, how in the world and I, am I going to end up being blameless at the second coming? Paul answers the question. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Mother Teresa said our progress in holiness depends on God and ourselves, on God's grace, and on our will to be holy. All right, so the first holy understanding, holiness and grace, have to embrace. Here's the second one. Because God is holy, he can be trusted. Now, this is a enormous idea, not original with me. I was reading this book by Jackie Hill Perry, which is the uh, recommended reading for this trimester, and just blown away by the simplicity and profundity of this thought. Here's what she writes. She writes, I don't remember the day I thought about it, and if my coffee was iced or warm, what I know is that, is that what I thought 
and what I thought of, I wanted an answer for. If God is holy, then he can't sin. If God can't sin, then he can't sin against me. If he can't sin against me, shouldn't that make him the most trustworthy being there is? Now listen to this logic. It's simple and it's awesome. If God is holy, he's not capable of sinning. If he isn't capable of sinning, he's not capable of sinning against me. And then she goes on to talk about things like this. When God commands us to do something, even when that thing seems extremely difficult, because he's holy, he can't sin, meaning that if you keep his command, even though it's hard, he will use the thing, even if it seems like a crazy thing to most human beings, to do good in you because he's only capable of doing good. I think sometimes we look at things God is commanding us to do in Scripture, and they are so out of whack with what's going on in the human family, in our culture, which is really not a whole lot different in many ways than the way it was in the first century and with all things Rome or, or how, you know, how Israel was commanded to be holy in relationship to the other nations around them. This, this isn't really anything new. It's just God's commands often fly in the face of the way most of the human family is conducting itself. And sometimes we'll read God saying, you know, this is the way you're supposed to live. This is what you're supposed to do. This is how you're supposed to think. And, 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 and this is how it's supposed to manifest itself in your life. And it's like, you know, if, 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 if I, I don't know, if I do this, most of the world would say I'm crazy. But because God is holy, he cannot sin. And he cannot sin against you, which means that if we'll simply be obedient to what God is asking us to do, we know that God has got us. It may seem crazy to us, but, but we simply trust him. So think about something, and I think most of us could think of something, that scripture teaches that you should not do that you're doing. Or think about something that you are not doing that you should be doing. Because God is holy, you can trust that whatever he is asking you to do or not do is good for you. Some of us are worried that if we obey God, we're going to be left, you know, twisting in the wind. And the fact is, God can't leave you twisting in the wind. It's not in his character. It's not who he is. If he says to do it, it's because doing it needs to be done. And when it's done, God, who is good, is going to do good to you. It's like, it's like you hear a lot of athletes talk about, you know, uh, some, some, uh, a uh, great coach that they played for, and uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've sat with uh, with a with a with a TLCC guy who who played for Coach Bill Parcells. And uh, these guys will tell stories about, you know, we were in the game and uh, it was a big moment and, 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 and the coach said to, to do X, Y, and Z and it didn't make any sense to me at all. It seemed like exactly the wrong thing to do, but because of who he is, you know, I know he'd already won, you know, a, a couple of Super Bowls and I, I know he, he, he's got a, a wisdom about him that's beyond me and because he said to do it, he said, in that moment, I didn't even think about it. I just went and did it, even though it was against everything I thought we should have done. And lo and behold, if the line didn't break and I didn't get down there and the, the 
pass wasn't caught and the touchdown wasn't made and the game wasn't won simply because I trusted the coach and I knew that what he was telling me was going to work and even though it didn't make sense to me. I mean, you hear people tell stories like that in a human context. How much more does it mean if God said it? If God said it, if God, you said what, God? Okay, God, if you said it, all right. I, I may not understand it. It may not make sense to me. My neighbors may think I'm crazy. The folks at work may laugh. It doesn't, you know, my bank, my, my financial consultant may tell me that that's not right, the right thing to do. But if you said it, I believe it. And if I believe it, I'm going to do it. And I know because you're holy, it's going to end up working out for my good. And this is where we need to understand, friends, that when God gives his commands, when he gives his rules, he does it because he, he made life to work a certain way. Some people want the benefits of the kingdom without, without wanting to, to obey the king. And that's not how this works. This whole Christianity thing doesn't work if we just kind of do it. It works when we're fully devoted to it. That's when it works. Tim Keller, the great Tim Keller said that human life works properly only when it's conducted in line with the owner's manual, the commandments of God. If you disobey the commands, you are actually acting against your own nature as God designed you. So God gives us rules for life so that we can live in alignment with his good intentions. And if we're wise, we will listen and obey and know that it's for our good. Here's this wonderful passage in Isaiah's prophecy. I'd I'd like for you to hear as if God God's looking at you and in a, in a nice, soft voice saying these words to you, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. If only you have paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river, your well-being like the waves of the sea. Can you, can you, can you hear God saying that to you? You know, I love you so much. I want what's best for you. If, 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 if only you would listen to the things that I'm telling you to do. If only you would conduct your life in the ways that I, I've taught you to. Your peace would be like a river. Your well-being would constantly be like waves crashing against you. Just listen to what I say. On the other side of obedience, God are amazing things. Guys are amazing things. And sometimes I think we miss the amazing things because we're not willing to say yes to something God is asking us to do. We talked about this last week, Joshua 3, 5. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things to you. To consecrate yourselves means to fully devote yourself, fully devote yourself. You know, guys, I don't decide what I'm going to teach um, by taking a poll as to what I think people want to hear, and I don't misunderstand me. My preference would always be to talk about things that you want to hear. I care deeply about you. I care deeply about what you think. I respect what you think. You matter so much to me that I, I could take a poll and let it influence to some extent what it is that I would teach about. But, but, but really what, I, what I'm trying to do is to, to have an understanding as much as I can by the grace of God in partnership with other leaders of our church. What, are, what do we think needs to be said right now? And, and right now, what I believe needs to be said in September of 2023 at the Life Christian Church to all of us is that God has amazing things to do in our lives, but he's asking us for full devotion first. He's asking us for full devotion. And, 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 and that there are things that, that you are so close to stepping into in your life but a lack of obedience to God's word in some area of your life is keeping you from what God really wants. Consecrate yourself. The Lord is about to do amazing things. Real quickly, and I'll start to wrap this up. Holiness is full devotion to God. Charles Colson wrote, holiness is the complete surrender of self and obedience to the will and service of God. Or as Mother Teresa sums it up, complete acceptance of the will of God. 
Holiness then is conformative to the character of God and obedience to the will of God. Holiness is moving from self at the center, which is the essence of sin, to God at the center, which is the essence of holiness. It begins with the confession we made last week in response to who we used to call Doubting Thomas, who when he understood who Jesus was, said, you are the Lord of me and the God of me. What area of your life may there be that God is not God of, that God is not Lord of, that you're not letting him direct Holiness has to do with being devoted. It's being devoted entirely to God. It's not a kind of thing. 99% devotion to God is not devotion. It's full devotion. It's the whole thing. So to be fully devoted then, what do we need to say no to? I, I have no doubt probably all of us have some things in our lives that we need to say no to. The Bible offers a number of those things. Um, uh, explicitly. Here, here's an example of that. I, I offer this to you just as a taste of the kinds of things that we know we need to say no to. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, putting anything in front of God, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, Paul said, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, again, that's a sampling of the kind of things, the kinds of things. It's not a complete list by any stretch of the imagination. I think we know the kinds of things that we must say no to. And on the other hand, I would say that most of us, if not all of us, have things in our lives that we know we need to say yes to. And some of those are things explicitly taught in Scripture, things that we're supposed to do that we're not doing. And the fact is that, that, the, that God really means it. He's not kidding around when he says, I want you to do X, Y, or Z. We're really supposed to do those things. And, and, and then there are those things that perhaps aren't explicitly taught in Scripture, but that we know, nonetheless, that we're supposed to be doing. Because in your own relationship with God, you feel called to something. You've, you've been discussing with some friends or a spiritual advisor, I'm feeling called to do whatever. Well, part of holiness is, is, is saying, God, whatever it is you're calling me to do. So there are things we should say no to. There are things explicitly script, written in Scripture we should say yes to. And then there are those things that we know that we're feeling called to that we should say yes to as well. And I would say if, if that's true, if you're being called to start a new business, then starting a new business is a holy proposition. See, that's part of holiness. It's just saying yes. It's, it's being obedient. If you're being called to foster a child, then fostering a child is a holy proposition. If, if you're being called to run for school board or town council, then saying yes to that call and putting yourself out there, that's an act of holiness. Do you understand? It's not just saying no, it's saying yes as well. It's standing up and doing whatever it is you believe God is calling you to, saying, God, I know if you're asking me to do this, it may seem nuts to me right now, but I know you're, since you're holy, you cannot sin against me. And, and therefore, when I say yes to whatever it is you're calling me to, it's only going to end up working out for my good. Charles Colson. Hey, anytime you want to clap, it's fine with me. So I'm sorry for, sorry for interrupting. Uh, Charles Colson said, holiness is the everyday business of every Christian. It evidences itself in the decisions we make and the things we do hour by hour, day by day. Holiness is obeying God, loving one another as he loved us. Holiness is obeying God, even when it's against our own interest. Holiness is obeying God, sharing his love, even when it's inconvenient. inconvenient. Holiness is obeying God, finding ways to help those in need. Holiness, the bottom line, friends, is holiness is obeying God. So here's the third holy understanding that I'll offer, and, and, and I'll do my best to be really quick with it. It's to say, let me close with this, holiness is irresistibly attractive. The 96th Psalm tells us to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let me just say, holiness is beautiful. 
When you are around a person that you sense is close to God, there is something very attractive about that person. It makes sense. God is holy. That's who he is. He is infinitely attractive. And the more someone reflects who he is in their lives, then the more there's something attractive that's communicating at a spiritual level that's really, really compelling. Um, I, I, I read a little interaction this week between two Christian luminaries, Richard Foster and Dallas Willard. Richard Foster wrote the classic Celebration of Discipline. Dallas Willard wrote Divine Conspiracy and many other classics, two really great Christian thinkers. And um, they were standing together in a church in Florence that I've been blessed to, to be in, not Florence, Kentucky, but uh, I've been there too, Florence, Italy. And uh, they're standing in a church called Santa Croce. And Santa Croce in Florence, this city of gorgeous churches, is a relatively simple church. Um, but in Santa Croce, there are, if I remember right, like 276 grave stones, people who were buried under the floors of Santa Croce. Again, in, in Florence terms, a relatively simple church, but it's a Franciscan church. So it was built many, many years ago by the order of St. Francis when that meant something, it, you know, near enough to St. Francis's life, who was known for his passionate devotion to God, known for giving up everything because of his love for God, who was known as a holy man. St. Croce was, was built soon enough uh, after his life that those following him, the Franciscans, were known to be holy, sincere people, really going after God. Well, so, so Richard Foster and Dallas Willard are standing and looking at all these gravestones, including in St. Croce, some of the most famous Italians who've ever lived are buried. Michelangelo is buried there. Uh, uh, Dante is buried there. Uh, Machiavelli is buried there. Rossini is buried there. A number of, of, of the, the most famous Italians who ever lived. And, and, and the question Richard Foster said came to mind is why were they buried here in this relatively simple Franciscan church when they could have been buried at the Duomo, which is just a short walk away. The Duomo, as most of you will know, is one of the most glorious works of architect in the world. Uh, um, it's, it's, Florence is built around the Duomo. It is, it is outlandishly beautiful. Michelangelo, in fact, said the gates of the Duomo could be the gates of paradise. The gorgeous green and white marble, the, the dome that, that, that was the largest dome in the world until Michelangelo went and did St. Peter's Basilica and beat the, the Duomo in Florence by just a, a little bit. I mean, it's just spectacular. So all, all of that to say, Richard Foster and Dallas Wheeler are standing there saying, why, why would Michelangelo choose to be, Michelangelo especially, choose to be buried here instead of the Duomo? Why would, why would Dante want to be, but anyway... To which Dallas Willard replied that it was because of the extraordinary holiness of Francis and the Franciscan friars that came here. Their power resided in their holiness. Even a hundred years later, that holiness still filled the place. It drew people by the thousands. And they, all these famous people, wanted to be near such uncommon holiness even in death. Now, again, I took a long time to make a simple point. The point is that, I mean, you just think about Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo could have been buried at the Duomo, but decides to be buried in this rel relatively simple Franciscan church because the holiness of the place as he perceived it was more precious than the gorgeous architecture of the Duomo. And I just simply make the point that holiness is attractive, it's compelling, sometimes in ways that don't make sense, that are counterintuitive, that from a, a material view of the world is, is not a conclusion that you would come to. But there's something beautiful about a person who says, I am going to pursue holiness. I am going to do my best to grow close to God. I'm going to do my best to order my life according to the teachings of his word. I'm going to raise my kids according to his teachings. 
teachings. I'm going to try to do my marriage according to his teachings. I'm going to handle my finances according to his teachings. I'm going to build my business according to his teachings. And there's something about that. And the more that you grow and that God grows in you, if you please, and this holiness thing happens, the more beautiful you and your life become to everybody around you. And the other thing I would say about that too is holiness is contagious. I've run out of time. I'm not finished, but I've run out of time. And and I'll tell you, holiness is contagious. Jesus knew this. In fact, there's a great book by the scholar Craig Blomberg called The 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 the, the uh, 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 the con- uh, holiness is contagious is what I think it's called. That's about how Jesus interacted with the culture of his day in a way that said, you know, some people think holiness is about separating yourself from sinners. And, and, and that's a subject for another day. Uh, holiness does have something to do with separation, but Jesus didn't do that. He was able to maintain his holiness while hanging out with sinful people because he believed more in the power of his holiness than the power of their sin. See, holiness, we're not afraid of the world. We're hoping that who we are by God's grace is contagious to the people around us and that it becomes the most influential thing. You know, Scripture says, there's this Scripture that, that, Paul, uh, that, that Paul wrote where he said, uh, he said that, that, that if, if a person is living with an unbeliever, that the unbeliever is sanctified by the believer. No one knows for sure exactly what that means, but one thing is certainly true, that the holiness of the believer is so powerful that it makes the environment around them holy as well and even affects people in our lives who may not believe. I want you to know because you are his, you are holy, and because you are holy, you are powerful, and it's not by your own strength, it's by God's grace. And when you're called to be holy, you're called to something magnificent. And we all should go after it with everything in our lives by God's grace. Somebody say, I want to be holy. Would you stand with me, please?